spiritual idolatry, you were once more enslaved. But I heard your plea and brought another rescuer to strike down your oppressor. From Ephraim, the judge Deborah commissioned men to chase down my enemies. I went before my people and my foes found no escape. From the weak and doubtful, I raised a mighty warrior. No sword was raised against your enemy, and yet, through my power, they were slain. Again you turned from me, you pleaded for rescue, and the rejected became your judge. A foolish vow was made, and innocence was sacrificed. Soon the mightiest of judges arose. One thousand men lay dead in his wake and his power was stripped of him when the Nazarite's hair was cut. But I allowed him one last victory. Age after age, you turned your back to me. But I did not turn from you. I rescued you. I went before you. And I raised mighty warriors to judge over you. Well, we're in week number 30, and today we're going to look at part two of Gideon's story. Uh, just as a reminder, two Sundays ago, we talked about this big topic called courage, uh, and we encouraged one another to have more courage, to take a step of faith in courage. And then last week, we kind of coupled the two in Gideon part number one with the idea of fear and how fear can have such a grip on us that it keeps us from God's best for our life. I continue to hear from folks throughout the week just how impactful last Sunday's message was. I want to encourage you, if you missed it, uh, go back and watch it. It's on YouTube. Can I just say that I had a part of my sermon on TikTok reach 40,000 views this week. Always got to be by him, doesn't it? Yes, Noel edited it and posted it. But I preached it. Uh, but no, but it's interesting, right? Like, uh, uh, I, I don't know how much time you spend thinking about reach. Um, but, but the reach of these messages, if you never consider it, they go far beyond what happens just in these four walls. I mean, every single Sunday, we have people that are watching online. Throughout the week, the, the message is posted, and, and week after week after week on YouTube, we see the views continue to climb, and then you have a moment like this. And we only had one other TikTok video grow past that, but I've since deleted it. I'm just kidding. It was a view of Noel dancing. It got 60,000. Like, uh, you can tell where people's priorities are. Uh, <laughs> But 40,000 views. I think it was at uh, 5,000 likes and uh, 100 and some comments. Like, people are engaging with the content. And so uh, I want to encourage you that as you, as you listen to these messages, just understand you may walk away and say, eh. but there are people every single day of every single week that are being impacted deeply by the words of God that are spoken here on Sunday morning. And I think that's good news. I think that's good news. It's okay, you don't have to applaud. Let's look at Gideon's story. Gideon, we saw last week, he had a God encounter. And in these moments, God looks at Gideon and he calls him what? What was it? Mighty warrior. Mighty warrior. And Gideon, of course, has this moment where he's insecure, he's self-secure. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't really believe what God says about him. He says, I'm the least of my tribe. I'm the, I'm the least of my brothers and sisters. I'm the least. And yet here you are calling me mighty warrior or mighty hero. He even tells Gideon, he says, go in the strength you have. In other words, don't go and train for a couple of years. Don't go try to find somebody else to step into your shoes. Just go in the strength that you have because I see more in you than you see in yourselves. In other words, God says to Gideon, you be you and I'll be me. Anybody thankful for those words today? You be you and I'll be me. And so God shows up and he tells Gideon that he's sending him on this rescue mission, this rescue mission to save the Israelites from the Midianites. And he says to him, am I not 
sending you? In other words, is it not my power, my presence that is going with you? You shouldn't be afraid. You should have courage. It's kind of like when Jesus says, lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. He says, am I not sending you? Am I not going to be with you? And so we pick up the story in chapter 6 of the book of Judges in verse 16, and it says, the Lord says to him, I will be with you. And then he doubles down and he says, you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. And that's where your shout cue goes, everybody. As if you're fighting against one man. Can I just tell you, it was more than one. It might have only been two or three, 100,000, but it was a lot of people. And he says, you're going to be battling them as if they are one man. And this is the point in the story where all of us should shout. We should all say, yeah, let's go. There's no way this couldn't possibly come to pass. God's going to deliver Israel from that oppressive Midianites. And so Gideon runs out with his army, and he slaughters his foes. Wrong. He doesn't do that at all. Instead, Gideon goes, yeah, but wait just a minute. Wait just, and we look at it, we read the story like, Gideon, you idiot. Like God is literally standing in front of you saying, go, I'm going to be with you. In fact, not only am I going to be with you, but the fight's going to be so easy, it's going to be as if you're only fighting one person. And Gideon says, wait just a minute, I need a sign. I need a sign before I go. I need a sign before I trust. God, show me a sign. Yeah, but God said, no, 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 show me a sign. Yeah, but, but God said, no, 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 show me a sign. And we find ourselves right there in the middle of the tension saying, that's me. That's where I transpose myself into the story. God said, but wait just a minute. God said, you will do greater things than Jesus. Well, wait just, wait just a minute. Somebody else needs to go first. God said, you're more than a conqueror, more than, beyond a conqueror, get it? Yeah, but I'll do my conquering on another day. I just need to stay home and read my Bible. God says, you're forgiven. Yeah, but I need to kind of feel forgiven before I accept forgiveness. God says, but then we're like, yeah, but wait. And it becomes this everyday walk for an everyday Christian. And we begin to see how much you and I, if we're being honest in this room today, how much we are truly like Gideon. We find ourselves reflecting on truth, truth that God said about us and our circumstances, our relationships, our feelings even. And yet we live like we need more of a sign from God before we start trusting him. More of a sign from God before we start living like he says we should. Church, we have the Savior of the world. We should be the most faith-filled people on earth. But instead, we say, I know what God said, but wait. I still need a sign. And we begin bartering. We begin negotiating. We begin trading. You ever done this or yeah? God, if the Colts will just win one more Super Bowl, then I'll start going to church every week. I was pulling back the veil of my prayer. No, wait, I come to church every week. (laughs) God, if that person texts me out of the blue, then I'll know it's you and I'll invite them to Easter Sunday. God, if you take this sickness or health issue away, then, then I'll start serving you. God, if you just let my Powerball numbers hit this week, then I'll start being generous. Hmm. Let's get real for a minute. God, if you send me a spouse, then I'll be so faithful and committed to you that you won't even recognize me. And we pray these prayers and we make these asks of God. Despite all that God's told us to do and to be and to become. And we say, yeah, God, I know what you said, but first I'm gonna need a sign. First, I'm gonna need you to show me something. First, I'm gonna need you to prove yourself me. And so we see in Gideon's story this process, this process of asking God for signs before he'll fully trust him, before he'll fully obey. And it all starts with this sacrifice, maybe a a baby step, if you will, 
a sacrifice. And we pick it up in verse 27. It says there, Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. Now, I hope you caught that in the story. He did what God told him to do, but he did it under cover of night. He did what God told him to do, but he was still afraid. He did what God told him to do, but there was still a little part of him that's saying, I I don't know about this fully. But he acted in obedience. He did it anyway. He was afraid, but he still obeyed. And this, my friends, is the Christian walk, isn't it? The Christian walk, it's not based on Bible studies or deep preaching or Greek exegesis or looking for eschatological signs in everything that happens in the news. The Christian walk is and always has been rooted in steps, in action, in you and me being afraid but choosing to trust God anyway. Acting on what we know about God, even though we may be doubting God in the moment. That is the Christian walk, friends, and nothing will grow your faith more than stepping out in faith. Pastor A.W. Tozer put it this way, God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things we can do by ourselves. We make our faith about so many different things often downplaying the role that faith itself actually has on who we are and who we're becoming. So a few quick observations for us today. I won't keep you long, but I want to explore Gideon's story through the lens of faith. Faith. So we talked about courage. We talked about fear. Today, I want to share with you about faith. And here's my first point. Write it down, if you will. Faith takes time to grow. Faith takes time to grow. Faith takes time. Listen to me. Baby steps of faith are still steps of faith. Some of you need to let yourself off the hook a little bit. Quit being so hard on yourself. Baby steps of faith are still steps of faith. I have found in my own life that actually baby steps of faith are what lead to the big steps of faith. We imagine somehow that the baby steps are up to us. And it's only the really big things of faith that we should leave up to God, but it's actually really not true. The baby steps are up to God just as much as the big steps. It's a lot like lifting weights. You can tell that I'm a regular weightlifter. Why did you laugh? If I want to bench press 350 pounds, I'm not going to start at 350 pounds on the bar. Security. (laughs) I'm done. (laughs) But faith is a lot like that, right? Like we, we imagine, we can imagine 350 and we only need, did I hear 12? Did I hear 12 pounds? Is that what I heard? Just the bar. Oh, well, thank you. That's a little more than 12 then. How much? 45? See? 45. No, I use the big bar. <laughs> I feel like you're laughing at me, not with me. <laughs> That's true. But just like with weightlifting, I start where I am, the bar, and then I take steps toward the goal. Once I've got one weight level down, I add more weight what Gideon did. Some of us need to, be, need to stop being so hard on ourselves. Give ourselves some slack. Start where you are, church, and then move on from there. Faith, after all, takes time to grow. In Gideon's story, Gideon says to God in chapter 36, if you will save Israel by my hand as you've promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. Maybe you've heard parts of this story before. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground around it is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you've said. And so he kind of ups the ante a little bit and says, okay, 
yeah, I did a little sacrifice thing. I trusted you with it. You showed up and you, you used your, uh, your cane and you burned up the offering. I knew it was you. So now I'm going to try something else, another little sign. Before I'm going to go put my life in danger, I'm going to lay this piece of carpet down, right? I'm going to lay this little remnant down. And if it's wet and the ground around it's dry, then I'll know it's you. But then, of course, he takes another step. And he says, well, yeah, but, but now I'm going to lay it down. And uh, if it's dry and the ground around it's wet, then I'll know it's you. And he continues bartering with God. It's a very small step. This step, in fact, cost Gideon nothing. This small step, this act of obedience, this step of faith actually cost him nothing. He went to Lowe's, he bought a little carpet remnant, and that was it, two ninety nine. dollars but it was a baby step. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing this. Y'all are going to go to Lowe's after church, aren't you? I got something I need God to prove to me. Don't, I, I wouldn't recommend it. I don't think this is a regular way that God speaks to us. But, God, but Gideon did it, and it grew his faith. I believe that God probably knew that that's what it would take to grow his faith. He knows what it will take with you. In fact, we see in other places of Scripture where there's this similar type of baby step. You're familiar with each of these stories, I'm sure of it. Peter, Peter shows us this baby step. When they're in the boat, the disciples are in the boat and they see this thing that looks like a ghost moving toward them. And Jesus says, peace, it is I. And Peter says, well, if it's you, then call me out onto the water. He says, I have faith, but not enough to do what you're doing. I'm afraid but I know that you can calm my fears. I want to come to you, Jesus, but I'm just not sure I can on my own. Peter has this moment, and it happens regularly for him, doesn't it? If you read the story of Peter, you see these times when he takes a baby step of faith and then he ends up way back here somehow. It happens over and over to him. And I don't know about you, but if God had helped me to walk on the water, I'd probably trust him every day for the rest of my life. Probably not. First time my checking account gets low, I'm like, God, where were you? Go back to walking on water again. Another story in Mark chapter 9. Father asking Jesus to heal his son. I love this. I do believe, but help me overcome my disbelief. And it seems like a paradox on the surface, doesn't it? And it seems like those two things would never go together. But church, I'm here to tell you, that is the walk of faith. That really is what it is. I've not met a single person in all of my years that has had a straight line trajectory of faith. Where they took a step of faith, it grew. They took another step of faith, it grew. Took another step of faith, it grew. Where they never took a step back. Where they never doubted again. Where they never found themselves in this place. Where they say, I believe, but there's still a part of me that needs to be dealt with. There's still a part of me that, man, if this part could go, I would be all in. And he says, this father about his son, says what so many of us, say or need to be saying, God, I don't have all this faith stuff figured out yet, but I sure am trying. And it is a real and vulnerable moment that each and every one of us can connect with. I don't have it all figured out, but Lord, help me, I'm trying. I want to be obedient. I need you to help me. I really do believe God. But there's just these areas of my life that I just need that extra push to overcome my unbelief. And why is that? Well, it's because faith takes time to grow. Faith takes time to grow. Here's my second observation about it. It's that faith grows through and is measured in obedience. Faith grows through and is measured in terms of obedience. I love the story of Gideon because Gideon's faith is nothing like a light switch. God doesn't, I mean, think about the whole story. God's literally talking to him. You would think that would be enough. God's here, okay, my faith's on 100. But it's not. 
It's not a light switch. I love how real and authentic he is. It's not a light switch. And, And for all of us, it's nothing like a light switch. I love that it's not like, okay, I took the first step of faith and now I'm a man full of faith. Because church, that's my story. I've taken countless numbers of faith steps and I still find myself lacking the faith I need in some circumstances. There are things that I've walked through in my life and I've seen God show up and now, now I know God is able. Is there a witness in the house today? I know that he's able. Why? Because I had faith and I trusted him and he showed up. Come on, JD, you got a testimony. But then, there are other things. Perhaps I'm walking through something for the first time. Or I've been walking through it for a long time and I've prayed for God to step in and he just hasn't done it yet. And I find myself afraid. I find myself caught in that fear that we talked about last week. My faith is low and it doesn't quite come to me as quickly as I'd like for it to. And Gideon's story is just like that. But I think Gideon would say to us today, step out in obedience. Have faith. Maybe maybe not quite the journey that he was on, but have faith in today's context. Trust God. Because as you do, I believe he would say to us, as you do, you will see that your faith grows over time through your obedience. Every time you are obedient to God and you step out in faith, because that's what obedience will require, your faith will grow. And as we watch Gideon's faith journey continue, we see him stop questioning God and just start obeying him. God keeps leading, but now Gideon is following And although Gideon's path was the way that it was, I want to mention again, it's not often the way that God operates. Instead, and far more often, he tells us what he told Gideon on the front end, go in the strength you have. Go in the strength you have. Go in the skills you have. Go in the circumstances you have. Go with what you have, and that's where my strength will be made perfect in your weakness. Don't wait on a sign, in other words, just obey. And I want to say to those of us that are early on the journey, take those baby steps. Don't be so hard on yourself. I want to release that from you. Don't think you should be further down the road than where you are right now. But to the others, the rest of us who've been following Jesus for a while, let me just say to you, you should probably be further along than where you are. We'll talk about that more in just a second. Pick back up the story. Chapter 7, verse 7. The Lord says to Gideon, With the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. Let all the others go home. And so Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Now, what you need to understand here is the others. The others. The others that go home, 32,000 men. So immediately Gideon goes from, it's going to be as if you're fighting one man. Well, yeah, because I got 32,000 people with me. Now he's down to 300. Now he's down to 300. Why would God do that? I have no idea. I mean, we can say he's testing his faith. He's, he's making sure he's sure. He's showing his power. Sure, all of those fit. That's great. That's the way God operates. Maybe that's true. But at the end of the day, I want to put myself in Gideon's shoes and say, he trusted God. With 32,000 or with 300? Can we talk about your bank account for a minute? Do you trust God the same with 32,000 in it as you do with 300 in it? Or 32 and 3? Come on, somebody. The answer to that is probably not. Probably not. But here is this time that Gideon has, 32,000 to 300. But what did he do? He obeyed anyway. I'm sure there had to be fear. I'm sure there had to be questions, but he obeyed anyway. I'm sure there was this internal struggle going on inside of him, but he obeyed. Why? Because this faith thing had grown. He had trusted God before and he was able to take the next step. How do you and I know that our faith is growing? How do we know that our faith has grown? The things that we used to struggle with, we no longer struggle with. Or at least the struggles less, the struggles shorter. 
You know, one of the things that Consuela and I always share in, uh, in marriage counseling is that um, we haven't figured out how to eradicate arguing from our marriage. If you never argue, God bless you. But we argue. I'm always the reason. I said right over here. We haven't figured out how to eradicate fighting and arguing. What we have figured out is how to make it shorter before we apologize. Because what we've figured out is there's always gonna be tension in every relationship. There's always gonna be moments where we don't see eye to eye. And the goal should be for us to figure out how do we apologize, get to that apology stage quicker. Because isn't it, isn't it curious? Like, we always know we're gonna get there. So why wait so long to get there, right? And so, uh, why did I just share all that with you? Oh, faith grows over time. And I think that's what we see is that over time, <laughs> the struggle becomes shorter. The time from the lack of faith to the obedience becomes shorter. In fact, in verse 15, we see a different side of Gideon. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, you go back and read that, he bowed down and he worshiped. He returned to the camp of Israel and he called out, get up, the Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hand. We see him excited for battle. We see him excited to obey. We see him excited for what God is going to do. His faith has grown to the point where he says it is okay to obey and it's okay to inspire others to go with me on this journey. His faith grew just as ours does. And it all centers around God's voice. We hear God's voice, we obey, and we see all that God does. We recognize his voice, we believe his voice, and we allow our lives to be shaped around his voice. In fact, did you know, did you know that you are hearing God's voice right now through his word? I see three of you nod. That's great. So maybe that's, maybe that's an important point. How can I hear God? God just isn't speaking. Are you doing all the talking? God is still speaking. In fact, I want to invite us into just a moment where we can all hear God speak to us together. Would that be okay? Can you just bow your heads and close your eyes? God speaks to us today and he says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? In the same way, faith by itself if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. I pray that you'll receive that today, God's word. So let's get practical for just a minute. You can look on back up here. Nobody can leave church today saying God didn't speak to me. Let's do a quick self-assessment about faith. A quick self-assessment about where you are personally on your faith journey. The first category, and this is not meant to be all-inclusive, but I just want to hit on a few. The first category would be beginner. Beginner, you would say, you know what, I'm new to this faith thing. I just recently started following Jesus, or maybe, maybe you don't follow Jesus at all. But you're somewhere in the new stage, and it's all new to you. This is where the baby steps happen. This is where you step out little by little and begin trusting God with this newfound faith. This is the space that a person finds them in when the little things happen and you're like, oh, I think that might have been God. If you're in this stage, can I just say, embrace it fully. Just like everything I ever needed to learn, I learned in kindergarten, everything you need to understand about faith, you'll, you'll learn in your beginner stage. Some of you strong theologians are like, wait just a minute. Wait, there's so much more. No. This is what you need to know. I would argue that with anybody. All the other stuff is good. We're talking about faith. Stepping out in faith. Trusting God with your faith. All of that happens in the beginner, at least should happen in the beginner stage. That's why I love our kids in youth ministry so much. We're laying such a foundation. The Bible tells us, teach it to them when they're young. Why? Because when they're old, they won't turn from it. 
Why does it say that? Because it's the beginner stage that has such an impact. For some of us, we, we tried to hop over this stage, didn't we? We're mesmerized or we're, 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 we're uh, pulled toward what we consider deeper things. And we did it at the expense of these beginner things. And friends, I, I, I'd submit that that's in large part why we're such a, such a tough place as a church. Capital C Church. Because so many of us tried to, tried to leapfrog this beginner stage. And we found ourselves more interested in stories about Jonah than stories about Jesus. When the story of Jonah points to Jesus. But I don't know about you, but I didn't hear that in Sunday school. I didn't hear that when I was a kid. I heard about a guy that got swallowed by a big fish. And then I was like, really? Like that really happened? So then my mind went down all kinds of different trails. The beginning... The be- I'm getting myself in trouble today, J.D., I know I am. But the beginner stage is so vitally important because this is where we learn how to share, how to love, how to be kind, all of those things that I would say the church in large measure is missing today. So if that's where you are, take the baby steps. Embrace the baby steps. Learn them, apply them, write them on your hearts because it's so, so, so but then there's a second area. The second area is called plateaued. 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 It's kind of this space where you find yourself where faith is just kind of leveled out. For some of us, we would, we would probably say, well, you know, I've, I've got this faith thing down pretty good. I don't know anybody would really say that, but the heart of that is what I'm meaning. This is the stage where you think, yeah, you know, I've put in my years, I've served, I've, I've given, I've, I've done those things, and your faith just kind of begins to level out. It's not that you're not taking steps of faith, but it's not the steps of faith you used to take. It's not those big, bold, on fire steps. And business cycles, business cycles, anybody's interested in this, business cycles would tell us that when a business plateaus, the next category, anybody know what the next category after plateau is? Decline. Hmm. That's interesting. Does that work the same with faith? I would submit, yeah. Very few of us figure out how to take our plateaued stage and make it go up. I find that sad. Because isn't it the faith walk that makes faith exciting? I mean, isn't it the times when you step out and you you do something seemingly crazy for God, like starting a weekly homeless ministry? Isn't it those times that when you step out having no idea where it's going to go or no idea if God's even going to show up, and then he does, and man, that just sparks your faith. But for so many of us, we think church on Sunday morning is the spark, and it's not at all. It's the faith that we put into action. And in business, I don't know if this is true. This is all just coming to me. But, but so, so if after plateaued is, uh, is uh, decline, what's the answer? What's the answer to reverse a decline in the business world? Anybody know? What is it? Growth, but how do you get growth? Innovation. Innovation. You have to rework yourself, right? You can't just keep doing the same old things expecting to get different results, right? And so when you go plateau to decline, you have to figure out, okay, what am I going to do to do that? Well, innovation, what does that mean for us in faith? Innovation means I find new ways to interact with God, new ways to believe in God, new ways to step out in faith and follow God. Or maybe, or maybe for us as, as Pentecostal believers, I got to wrap up. I'm going way too long. I'm so sorry. But listen, as Pentecostal believers especially, maybe we need to go back to antiquity. Maybe we need to go back to the 1500s and read some of their writings. Maybe we need to employ some of their practices. Maybe we can discover some things of old that we can make new again. Okay, all right, that's a class for another. Here's the third one, withering. Thank you, Jeff, he's keeping me on track. Uh, Withering, and of course, this is the decline, right? So if we we go from, from plateaued to decline, it's really withering. And this is those of us 
who we look back on the recent years and we say, I haven't really taken a step of faith lately. I can't remember one time in the last 30, 60, 90 days where I did anything that was faithful. And when our faith begins to wither, James would say it eventually dies because it's in the doing that our faith is made strong. So I just want to share really quickly, I'll do this part quick, I promise. Some of us find ourselves in the waiting. We've, we're faith-filled. We've asked, we've stepped out, and we're just kind of waiting. Three things, just going to put them all three up, Jeff, if you would. Go ahead and love your neighbor in the waiting. That is never the wrong answer. Love your neighbor. So whatever it is that you're going through, whatever it is you're walking through, find a way to love your neighbor. That can be your coworker, your literal neighbor, your family, somebody. Love somebody because when you do that, it opens up a door to faith. Secondly, help create opportunities. So Tiara is a great example of that. Uh, she's not there, is she? Um, Tiara is a great example of that, right? Where she created an opportunity for her faith to be used. And then lastly, focus on the fruit of the Spirit. Flash them up there real quick. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. When we focus our lives on the fruit of the Spirit, then we will find that our faith will grow over time. And so here's my big idea. Worship team, come on back up. I'm closing. Don't be a church attender. Be a Jesus follower. Maybe I should say don't just be a church attender. Everyone won't show up next week. Yeah, be a church attender and be a Jesus follower. I've had about enough of you today. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, yeah. Hi, everybody. So, God, he just lines things up. It's so crazy. Uh, but I want to share. I shared my testimony with you guys about a month ago, right? Lost my job. Um, everybody told me everything was going great. Then they pulled me into a conference room and said, hey, you're being let go. And I was like, what is going on? Um, so many of you were so kind in so many different ways throughout this time with, with words and, and just affirmation, letting me know that I'd be okay. Um, and I really, I love you all and I appreciate all of you so much for coming up and saying the things that you said and doing the things that you did. For the first time in my life, I didn't need it. I knew I was going to be okay. And it's because I took a lot of really small steps of faith. Um, so, I wasn't getting any interviews. A lot of you have been following up and asking me those. I, I, I was applying for everything under the sun. Couldn't get an interview. I, I even got scammed at one point, which was really interesting. I've never heard of that. Um, but I, I almost, you know, somebody tried to steal my bank account uh, in the midst of applying for jobs. That was cool. Um, Luckily, saw through that, um, but uh, I went to a job, finally got an interview, went and met him, did the interview with him, and they told me, well, we'll get back with you. We got a lot of other interviews to do today, and so we'll see you later. Got a call that same day, and the HR representative told me, they were so impressed with you, they canceled all the other interviews. <laughs> And so, job's yours. Here's the price that we're going to bring you in at. I was like, well, that wasn't the original price that you guys quoted me and told me. And they're like, well, that ended up being all the money that was there in the budget. But I'll go back and speak to them because they really spoke highly of you. So she called me back the next morning and she said, they agreed. You're going to get the price that you want. You're going to get the salary that you want. So in the end, after doing this for a month, we didn't miss a paycheck. And, I, and, I, and it's not always this way. I just want to like caveat that. Like it's not always like this, but at the same time, only God. We didn't miss a paycheck. We didn't stop tithing. We didn't stop coming to church. I didn't call my pastor. On, actually, what I really did was I kept reaching out to my friend and he kept loving on me as my friend, not as my pastor. He would he, constantly checking in on me. And I don't think he did that because he's my pastor. He did that because he cares about me. 
I'm going to get a raise to lose my job, (laughs) y'all. That's crazy. That's the kind of stuff that God does when we stay faithful. Now, the best part about this sermon is 100% what Pastor just talked about. Man, I still don't fully trust God the way I should. And I've got so much farther to go. But thank God I trusted him in this moment and I took another step. You guys hear me? If you guys have never picked up on that, any time that you guys are in here and I pray and I open service, I say the same thing in every single prayer. God, I pray we take a step today because it's what it's all about. It's just taking a step. And so, yeah, it's pretty cool. Thank you, Jimmy. Stand to your feet if you would. The words of Jesus direct us in this moment. He says, I've told you these things so that in him, in Jesus, you and I, we can have peace. He readily recognizes that there will be opportunities to lose our faith. Opportunities to doubt, opportunities to have some unbelief, to have those troubles. But he says, have faith, take heart, be confident, because he's overcome the world. And church, there's nothing that you and I face that sit outside of that truth. He has overcome the world. So because of that, we can have faith. And I just encourage you in this next moment, we're going to sing a song. I want you to sing it from a place of faith. I don't care if you're off key, off beat, whatever. But let this song, let these next few words of this song be a song of faith for you. Taking a step and trusting Him. Someone to say, come on, my soul. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me and lift up your soul. Cause you got a lion inside of those hooks. Get up and praise the Lord. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me.
Won't you get shy on me? Lift up your soul. You got a lion inside of those words. Get up and praise the Lord. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me? Lift up your soul. You got a lion inside of those mouths. Get up and praise the Lord. All right, so as we um, come to the end of the service, I just for some reason just thought about about 40 years ago roughly when I was saved uh, some missionaries came through and they had a slogan and the slogan was there's a world to win and a king to see return and I think that's a great slogan to go out with in our minds as we uh, go into the rest of our week there's a world to win and a king to see return so as we dismiss I just pray that these words um, you'll just receive this blessing the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.